At this time, we ask all who are able all over the house to stand for the reading of the word of God. Yes, I'm so excited. We're going to be in Psalm 107. Very quick reading. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And there is an inscription at the top of the, of the psalm that I want to include in my reading. And it reads, Thanksgiving for deliverance from many troubles. Verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. For God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those God has redeemed from trouble and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Verse 2, once more, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those that God has redeemed from trouble. Some translations will say, from the hand of the enemy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. You may have your seats in the presence of God. And I ask that you pray with me very briefly on the subject, redeemed to rise. Redeemed to rise. Mother Maya Angelou once said, everyone in the world has gone to bed one night or another with fear or pain or loss or disappointment. And yet each of us has awakened, arisen, somehow made our ablution, seen other human beings and said, good morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, and it's amazing, she says. And wherever that abides in a human spirit, there is the nobleness, nobleness of the human spirit, despite it all. Black, white, Asian, Spanish, Native American, pretty, plain, thin, fat, vowed, or celibate, celibate, we rise. And she launches into the poem. And I invite you to join me and you, if you know it. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still, I'll rise. Do you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Have you ever thought about the faith of your mother? Have you ever had a conversation with her about what it was that made her so faithful? Do you know what? Do you know who she was faithful to? Do you know the things that she gave her heart to? The causes that moved your mother to action? The work that bid her out of bed every morning? The love that called her soul out of its hiding place? Do you know the grief behind her tears? Do you know the weight in her sighs? Do you know what your birth represented to your mother on the day that you were born? Have you ever heard your mother testify? 
Have you ever heard her remember and recall the things that the Lord had done for her, has done for her? Have you ever heard your mother speak of her crucibles and her shadows, her heartbreaks and her deep waters? Matter of fact, my sister, matter of fact, my brother, I guess I'll include y'all on our women's night. When was the last time you looked into the depth of your own story? You mined the mountain of your own memory and you peruse the passages of your own narrative. I love these stories. I love these testimonies for these are the transmissions of our mothers to us and our transmission to our children. These are the stories of how we got over and how we're getting over even right now as we speak. How I got over, how I got over. My soul looks back and wonders how I got over. Has your soul ever looked back and wondered how you got over? Have you ever asked yourself, how did I get over the things that I got over? Have you ever stopped to think about how did I get over being taken to a solitary place and singing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? How did I get over the terrifying diagnosis in my body and the battle that I fought for my health? How did I get over the rivers of tears that I cried when my mental health was hanging in the balance. How did I get over the times that I learned and I relearned and I relearned that my kin, my skin folk ain't always my kin folk. How did I get over being abandoned by those who said they loved me? How did I get over the car accident that totaled everything except for my God-given life? How did I get over the gossip and the rumors and the letters and the haters? How did I get over the rejection and the heartbreak? How did I get over the setbacks and the demotions and the close calls and the nevers and the not yet and the almost and the dead ends and the closed doors and the mountains that I could not climb? Has your soul ever looked Looked back and wondered, how did I get over? How did I get over? Well, in order to answer that question tonight, you have to step away from the things that happened to you. You have to move away from the circumstances that came for your life and challenged your very stability. You have to reassign your attention away from the hassles and the hurdles and you gotta fix your focus on the hand of your redeemer. You got the diagnosis, yes, and it was certainly a hassle, but you're sitting here tonight because you were healed by the hand of your redeemer. Yes, there were tears and they hurt you, but you're sitting here tonight because they were dried by the hands of your redeemer. Yes, you got left and it devastated your spirit, but you're sitting here tonight because the Lord took you in by the hand of the Redeemer. Yes, they talked about you and it wounded your spirit, but you're sitting here tonight. You're breathing tonight. You're worshiping tonight because they were silenced by the hands of your Redeemer. Is there anybody in God's house tonight that knows that there were circumstances that I faced? and there were moments that I came into and there were situations that I was entangled in but the hand of my Redeemer reached down into the thing that I was facing reached down into the thing I thought would take my life and rescued me and redeemed me is there anybody in the sanctuary that has a testimony that I was redeemed by the hand of my Redeemer well the Word of God promised us tonight that if you've ever had a moment or an experience of redemption by the hand of your Redeemer then let the redeemed of the Lord say so say so say that that means that you've got to open up your mouth and you've got to declare the praises of God who saw fit to pluck you out 
of the hand of the enemy. That means that sometimes you've got to make a joyful noise. Sometimes it means that you've got to lift up a boisterous shout because there was no other way. If there was no hand of my redeemer, I'll ask you one more time, Abyssinian, is there anybody in the sanctuary that identifies as the redeemed of the Lord? Then let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If we turn to this evening's text, we see that this is a psalm of thanksgiving. The psalmist is grateful, and the psalmist is calling his community to be grateful along with him. If you look at that inscription at the top of the psalm, it reads, Thanksgiving for deliverance from many troubles. It is a psalm, it is a song of thanksgiving, and it is among the first of its kind. Before we ever had, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. It could have been me out there with no clothes and no shoes. Before we ever had, thank you, Lord, we had, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Before we ever had grateful, 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 gratefulness, we had, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his love endures forever. But if we're really, really honest tonight, The inscription can be somewhat misleading. Why? Because the psalm is not only about deliverance from many troubles. It's a song about deliverance from exile. When God's people were kidnapped, stolen from Judah, and paraded into Babylon for years of subjugation and oppression and injustice and enslavement and domination and exploited under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. The exile was so bad, it was so long, that if you were to read through the Psalms and if you were to read through the prophets, so much of the content of the canon has to do with the exile. It's almost as if the exile is central to the story of God's people. It's almost as if this bad thing is the thing that everything else circles around. And I understand it. We gotta celebrate when we survive, right? We gotta celebrate the hard times to really appreciate the good times, but There's another side to the argument that sometimes we allow the bad part of the story to dominate the story. And so the text comes to challenge us tonight that that sometimes we've got to fix our perspective on the stories of our exiles and our, our disappointments and our pains. And we've got to, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to discover a new hermeneutical interpretive lens through which to see the things that have happened to us in order not only to redeem ourselves, but to redeem our stories. It gives us a couple of recommendations for redeeming our stories. And the first one is rejoice. Rejoice. And you might be wondering, Reverend Michelle, Isn't this a little bit out of place? Don't we usually save the rejoicing for the end? You know, we a black church. We got to shout at the end, right? Okay, so I have two answers to your question. One, my PhD is in homiletics, which means preaching. So I know what I'm doing and I'm going to get us there. (laughs) And the second thing I want to say is, you don't always have to wait till the end of a matter or to the end of a story to rejoice over what God is doing and to say thank you for whatever it is that's happening right now. As a matter of fact, if you adopt gratitude as a framework for understanding your life and if you adopt thankfulness 
as a lifestyle, then you begin to see things in the light of God's goodness despite whatever is going on around you. I believe that it was the psalmist's intention to put thanksgiving right at the beginning of the song, to immediately fix our perspective on the fact of God's redemption and not on the fact of the exile. To fix our attention not on the fact of the exile, but on the fact of redemption. Yes, the exile happened, and yes, it was bad. Yes, the people of God lost some loved ones, and they lost some battles, and yes, they suffered under the weight of injustice and oppression, but that is not where the story ends. And sometimes when we look back over our exiles and we look back over our struggles, it's easy to fixate on all that went wrong how wrong we were done and who said what about us and how wrong that decision was that was made against us and how bad it felt and how much sleep we lost and how much weight we lost and how much stress it caused. And I know that sometimes we gravitate to the bad things because replaying the bad thing justifies our anger at it justifies our anger and justifies us in our holding on to the things that happened against us. And sometimes, y'all know how we do, we carry that anger with us. Ooh, 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 it goes to bed with us at night and it talks to us in our sleep, ooh. And do you remember what he said? Oh, and then, it, and then somehow it's there when we wake up. Good morning, be angry today. We go to the shower with it, we wash our face with it, we commute with the anger. All the while we become one with it, we're intimate with our anger. And somehow, some way along, along the way, we begin to be so transformed by our anger and so transformed by the toxicity that it comes out in every one of our relationships and every one of our encounters and every one of our situations because we keep replaying the same broken record over and over and over and over again but oh what a difference a thanks makes tonight church what a difference a thanks makes my sisters and brothers thank you will change your whole outlook on things because it'll draw your attention away from the things that you lost and God will begin to show you all that you have left come on now thank you will begin to change you on the inside because instead of stewing over all the people that left you and all the people that spoke ill of you God will begin to show you who stuck by your side and show you who's your ride or die thank you will begin to heal you from the inside out because instead of clenching your fists in rage you begin to lift them in rejoicing and you can say thank you God for the thing that I've been through thank you that if it was meant to kill me it would have killed me thank you God that I'm better now because of the thing that I went through because I know now what I know now is there anybody in the sanctuary you might have gone through some hell and you might have gone through some high water and you might be angry tonight but I've been sent here tonight with a message from heaven to just let you know to let it go let it go tonight let it go in Jesus name because it's not worth it you the only one still mad you the only one still angry you the only one still thinking about it you're the only one with the blood pressure shooting sky high because you haven't let it go and so tonight I want to invite you to let it go to be to let it go and to release it because it is a time of rejoicing when you can begin to say thank you, you know that you're on to a, to a season of rejoicing. Rejoice that it came, but that it came to pass. That it came, but it came to pass. Let it go. Let it go and rejoice that you still have your life and you still have your mind and you still have the activity of your limbs. You still have your life. God is good for preserving the life of the redeemed. So you got to rejoice first, but then you have to reflect. You have to reflect. If you look at the psalm, verses 4 through 32, I invite you to read them devotionally 
describe four distinct experiences within the exile. Each experience follows the same pattern. There's a description of the trouble, and then there's the part where they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord responded and delivered them over and over again. And then there's their expression of thanksgiving and gratitude. But there's also a part in there. There's a part right after the description of the trouble and right before they cried out to the Lord, where the psalmist implicates the exiles in their situation. Verse 11 says that they became miserable because they rebelled against God's word. Verse 18 says that they became sick because of their iniquities. Verse 27 says that they began to drown because they were addicted to working to the point of exhaustion. All different scenarios, but they follow the same pattern. And I know that we're here for revival, and this might not be the most reviving thought, but I promise that there will be a breakthrough if it, cha- if it causes a change in someone's outlook. Sometimes the text re- uh, suggests that we have to reflect on our own contributions to our circumstances. When we do things we know ain't right. When we show up in ways that are less than loving and just and affirming. When we give up and we throw in the towel, we just waiting on the other person to walk off. It takes, hey, hey, let's be around, okay? It takes a grown woman to be able to sit down and get quiet before God, to reflect on her life and to admit, I could have done some things differently. I could have worked a little bit harder. I could have held on a little bit longer. I could have been kinder. I shouldn't have said the things that I said. Should not have done the things that I did. I was wrong. And let me be clear that no one ever deserves to be abused. No one ever deserves to be assaulted. No one ever deserves to be battered in any way, shape, or form. But there are times where we know we might have provoked some things. And if we didn't provoke it, we were certainly complicit in it. And so it takes a grown woman to be able to look back and see that regardless of anybody else's behavior, I could have had a higher standard for myself. Regardless of what anybody else was doing or what anybody else was saying, I'm always answering to my God. And this is the key. This is what it means to grow. And I'm sorry, but if you can't do that, then you're not a grown woman. If you can't look at your life and learn something from it, or look at somebody else's life, because I'm a firm believer that if somebody else is going through it, if I take some notes from her life, I might be able to avoid some things. But the key is to grow from it, not to hover over it, not to keep circling around it again and again to the point of inducing regret. You've got to just take the lessons from your life and make your observations and do better next time. Because when you know better, you'll do better. It's right here in that critical moment that the enemy wants to begin to lie to us and tell us that we're stuck in our ways and, and induce the spirit of regret. But I come against that spirit and I come against that lie in the name of Jesus because there is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. If you know now what you didn't know then, then you don't have to do now what you did then. I'm going to say it one more time. If you know now what you didn't know then, then you don't have to do now what you did then. You got to reflect on your life. You got to take your lessons and you've got to move on. Which takes us to the final suggestion in the text. It says that in addition to rejoicing and reflecting, we must rise. Let 
me turn now to Mother Maya. What I think is so profound about her poem is that while she's aware of the people writing her down in history with their bitted, twisted lies, and while she's cognizant of people who want to see her broken, and while she's heard around the way that she's offending some folks with her haughtiness and her sassiness and her sexiness, because haters gonna hate, <laughs> there's still a constant refrain. There's still a cornerstone that she returns to time and time again. Still, I rise. And right there in the middle of the poem, there are three attempts made on her life, on her very life. You may shoot me with your words, cut me with your eyes, kill me with your hatefulness, but still, she's determined. I will rise. I got a story, y'all. And it's a story that just happened to me today. And I said, thank you, Lord, because you know I needed an ending to my sermon. <laughs> oh, he's good. I woke up this morning, I'm new, I just moved back to Atlanta, right? Okay, so I just moved back to Atlanta and I woke up, I had to get into my rhythm. Um, you know, back in Chicago, I knew how long it was gonna take to get from my house to the airport. I had it all mapped out to a science, but I don't have that science in Atlanta because I've only been there for two weeks. And so this morning, it was so non-scientific, okay? <laughs> I get to the airport, and the woman hands me my boarding pass. She tells me, you've got to go to the sea gates once you get through security. Great, I'll go to the sea gates. But I didn't look at the boarding pass. So what ends up happening is I get to security, and because I just moved, I had to get a new ID. But I didn't know that the TSA doesn't take temporary ID. So the woman had to walk me from the, from the TSA pre-check line all the way to the standard line. And y'all know that line is always long. And it's long and it's slow because that's the one where you gotta take your shoes off and your belt off, and you gotta take your laptop out your bag and your jacket off, your earrings off. Gotta take your, your braids out so they don't be <laughs> patting your head down. <laughs> Lord Jesus. I was like, so I wanted to be on time, but I didn't know about the temporary ID situation and it set me back and I, w I had to go through all of those motions. So I got through security. I was like, I might make my flight. Um, God is good. Mm. Told you I didn't, check, I didn't check the boarding pass after she gave it to me, right? So I get all the way on the gate, all the way to the train, to the sea gates. And I was like, where's my flight on the little screen? Look at the boarding pass. She told, she told me sea gates, it was T gates. So I had to go back on the train, go C, B, A, T, by my gate, got to the gate in just enough time to walk onto the plane. And I had it all mapped out, y'all. I really wanted to be there in enough time to sit at the gate and get centered because I have to preach tonight. And uh, it just didn't happen that way. But as soon as the plane started to take off, I heard the Lord say, this is about to be very small to you. I determined that I was gonna leave all of that there in Atlanta. And the thing that I appreciate about flying is that any time you get on an airplane, the second the plane starts to take off, and the higher the thing goes and the higher that it rises, the smaller everything on the ground becomes. The smaller everything on the ground becomes. Listen, y'all, sometimes you've got to get to the point where you rise so high above the things that have happened to you. Where you rise so high above the enemy's traps that were set for you. Where you rise so high above the people who sought to take your life. And you rise so high above the circumstances that were meant to ensnare you that they become so small and they become beneath you. There ought to come a point in your life where your faith begins to swell so much that the things that once hurt you become the things that are now beneath you. You ought to rise so high 
high and you want to stay so high in God's blue sky that you begin to see that the things that are beneath you were very well meant to be your footstools. The things that God put in your way so you could step on them and rise. So you could step on them and rise. I want to invite you to think about these circumstances differently. They're not setbacks. They're stepping stones. They're not losses. They're, they're stepping stones. They're not permanent. They're stepping stones so you can get your footing right and rise. And if you want to rise tonight, Abyssinian, then the word of God suggests that you've got to lay down some things. You've got to lay down some people and you got to lay down some places and you got to lay down some mentalities and you got to lay down some behaviors. You got to lay down some affiliations. You got to lay down some relationships. You got to lay down antiquated political views. Sometimes you've got to lay down your life as you know it and step out on faith. Let us therefore lay aside every weight that so easily and sin that so easily besets us and let us run the race. Let us rise to the sky. Let's rest the race that was set before us. I like how Toni Morrison said it. She said, if you want to fly, you got to lay down all the stuff that weighs you down. So tonight I came to challenge you that if it weighs you down, you got to let it go. If it's tied around your neck, then you got to lay it down. If it suffocates your spirit, then you got to lay it down because it is beneath you at this point. You are a woman on the rise. You are a woman who's been redeemed to rise. Come on, somebody. You have not been redeemed to stay in the pit you're in. You have not been redeemed to stay sitting in the dark. You have not been redeemed to keep circling the same situation over and over again, expecting something different to happen. You've been redeemed to look up, not to look down. You've been redeemed to soar, not to soak in your misery. You've been redeemed not for the spirit of regret, but for the spirit of release. You've been redeemed to rise. So rise on wings like eagles. Run and don't get weary. Walk and do not faint, for you've been redeemed to rise. And the psalmist invites us in the very first verse of the text. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Think about what you've been redeemed from and allow your say so to be congruent with your redemption. I'm going to give you a second to think about the thing that you've been redeemed from. And then all together in the sanctuary, let the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord. The redeemed from the need for approval. The redeemed from sickness. The redeemed from poverty. The redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so in the sanctuary. Say so in the house of our God. Fill the room with worship. Did it, God? You did it, God. 